Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to my show. My name is Jason DaCosta, <coughs> and this is Consistent Preterism. Thank you for joining me today. Just kidding on the cough. That was totally fabricated. I feel great. Um, but wow, man, things have really uh, moved fast in this whole coronavirus, haven't they? Just a week ago, I <coughs> shared a uh, teaching, or a little, just a little uh, check-in, I should say, and was sort of uh, talking about it, saying, ah, it's going to pass, it's going to pass, and here we are today, and it's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. Um, so yeah, what about it? I mean, is it Bible prophecy? Is the world coming to an end? Is Jesus going to come down in the clouds like in a helicopter taking bullets off the chest like Rambo? Who really knows? I'm also kidding about that. Jesus already came back and this has absolutely nothing to do with Bible prophecy. It's funny, somebody at work uh, the other day had asked me, they, um, they know that I know a lot about the Bible or whatever, that I'm kind of like a Bible nut, nerd, whatever you want to call me. And so um, <clears throat> they had asked about it and said, don't you think that this is, you know, related? And of course, they don't read the Bible. They're not even Christian, I don't think, but they wanted to ask anyway. And so I said, uh, I said, absolutely not. I said, um, they, and then they, their follow-up question was, but isn't it, you know, doesn't the Bible talk about plagues and stuff? And, and I said, well, yeah, sure it does. I said, first of all, in its context, the plagues and the misery and the torment and the judgment and the punishment was all upon Mystery Babylon, which we know was Old Covenant Jerusalem. But even still, if, if you wanted to make a case that coronavirus was a sign that the end is near, well, what about the Spanish flu? which existed in 1918, over 100 years ago, and infected some 500 million people, killing roughly 10% of them, which would be 50 million people. So what about that, right? I wonder if when the Spanish flu was taking down all those people, I wonder if people thought that it was the end of the world. I'm sure they did. I'm sure many of them thought that Jesus was going to come down in a helicopter taking bullets off the chest like Rambo. And guess what? Here we are a hundred years later with no sign that he even will. So my point is, is don't overreact, okay? Obviously, if you're a preterist or an I.O. or you're not going to overreact. If you're a futurist, you're probably staring up into the clouds as we speak, waiting for his glory to appear. But I hate to break it to you, it ain't happening. Um, so with that said, I also wanted to, uh, briefly mention that my wife actually uh, asked me the other day, which was, um, kind of interesting because she hasn't asked me about Bible things in a while. Um, she knows full well where I stand. She knows pretty much for the most part what I believe. Um, but I found that it's just best not to chat about it. We have a great relationship and uh, it's better than ever. But I just feel like sometimes these religious uh, discussions are not very profitable for relationships, um, especially when one person believes it and the other person doesn't. Um, so we haven't really had that discussion. I just kind of leave it on her. If she wants to talk about it, cool. If not, no worries. But uh, she asked me the other morning, she said something like, um, what does the Bible say about the time like just before the end and I'm like I'm like oh, okay I know where this is going obviously with all this corona stuff going around she's trying to kind of you know ask and inquire about what the bible says about you know the end of the end of the world or the end of time or the end of the age and so I was you know very calm and I told her I said well the bible doesn't talk about the end of the world the bible talks about the end of old covenant Israel old covenant Jerusalem and their end, their destruction, that was the end of the world that was at hand when Jesus said the things he did. And so we had a pretty decent uh, conversation, but I, I found out and I realized that now, having been in I.O. for quite some time, presenting it was pretty easy. And um, presenting it in a way that was really understandable for her was really easy. Um, I, was, I basically just told her about the curse. You know, I explained how... You know, Adam is probably symbolism, and Adam, um, even if he was a real man, he 100% uh, 
um, describes Israel's law, covenant, death, exile relationship with their God. Um, and so I, I told her that, you know, in the beginning we see Israel being told about the curse from Moses. And that is sort of like the foundation of the story. Um, and then as we go through the story, we see that these Israelites are dispersed, they're scattered, they're predicted that they would be scattered into all nations, and that at some point God would turn and have mercy upon them, and uh, the sheep would be gathered back in. And wouldn't you know it, that's exactly what we see taking place in the last days. And so it was just a real clear and easy way of presenting it, and I think she really understood it there for a moment. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, a lot of people, when you explain things to them, they might understand it for a moment, and then they end up going right back into the confusion. Um, either they don't remember it, or maybe it didn't sink in well enough. Who really knows, right? But um, I felt that, you know, she understood it, and it was good. And then what was interesting after that, um, David King had uh, texted me and uh, asked me about how I would present I.O., uh, to someone who had never heard it before or something along those lines. And so I just basically repeated that. I said I would start out with Moses. I would show the promise of the curse. I would show the uh, dispersions and the scatterings into all nations throughout the story. I would continuously jump upon that trajectory and show them that this was the, the, the direction that the story was always pointing towards. Um, and then when you come to the end, you have a uh, sort of fairy tale like in gathering of all these lost sheep and the shepherd is going out and seeking his sheep and then the end comes the shepherd comes for them and so uh yeah i mean it's been kind of an interesting revelation to me that um i'm very capable of explaining this stuff <clears throat> to someone in layman's terms <clears throat> excuse me gosh i uh have a little horsey throat um but yeah so that was kind of cool but anyways, a lot of stuff's going on, like I'm sure is the case in many of your lives with this stupid ass coronavirus. Um, you know, at first I thought it was a bunch of horse shit. Um, then as it started to escalate and the media started to, you know, push it down our throats a little more, um, I began to realize that maybe it's a little more serious than I thought. Although I still hold reservation about that, I think that um, perhaps there's something bigger going on here. I don't know. I'm not really uh, a, a big conspiracy guy, although I um, do believe that some of this, some of these things that we read in the media and hear in the media are conspiracies and they are um, uh, political and stuff like that. But I don't know about this one. It's kind of weird. It seems like um, it seems like the world and Trump and leaders and everything wouldn't destroy <clears throat> the economy just for a you know agenda for a smaller agenda i mean uh, what can be possibly bigger than the economy and right now the moves and the measures that they're taking are absolutely destroying the economy and uh, i might add an economy that was pretty darn good <laughs> being someone who was in that economy and, and saw the rise and the fall and stuff for the last two decades, um, I can say that it was very strong and we were looking forward to another great year here at my company. So just seeing how bad this has affected the economy um, and knowing how much of an economy guy Trump is um, has really uh, caused me to say, well, you know what, this could be a little more serious. And, um, you know, but then again, when you look at the death rate, the mortality rate of this thing, it's so laughable. Um, now, I'm not downplaying the severity of this for the elderly and things of that nature. Um, that could be very scary. But you think about the, I think it's something like 2%, maybe 2.5% of people who contract this thing die from it. 2.5%. Um, and then if you actually think about this deeper, um, they say that most people who contract it do not show symptoms or at least a good portion of them. So if, if most people are asymptomatic and are not exhibiting symptoms, then we don't know how many of these people actually have this thing, right? So let's just say that the, uh, the current number in America is 7,000 confirmed cases. Well, if a good portion of people are asymptomatic, meaning they show no symptoms, then that 7,000 could be quite higher. 
It could even be 20,000 cases and we only have 7,000 confirmed because most people for the common cold are not going to go take a coronavirus test. I know I sure wouldn't. So think about that. If there's only been, <clears throat> let's say, I don't know, 60 or 70 deaths and they're basing their 2.5% mortality rate on a total of maybe 7,000 cases in the US, then what is the actual mortality rate if 20,000 people actually have it, right? I mean, think about that. It's uh, probably, I don't know, 0.6%. So half of 1%, um, and that could be even less because there could be more than 20,000 people that have this thing. So all I'm saying is I think that there is um, a media aspect of this that blew this way out of proportion um, and really just, you know, destroyed people. Um, obviously, with what's going on in Italy, that kind of throws a different light upon it. There, there seems to be um, a lot more death there and their health system can't handle the, uh, the cases. So that's pretty sad. But, you know, overall, I think that, you know, I read I read an article that said that the word coronavirus, this was last week, this isn't even this week, I can only imagine how much this has escalated since. But last week, I read an article that Ebola, when Ebola was around, the media mentioned Ebola 11 million times, 11 million times, the media throughout the news, newspapers, social media, collectively, the word Ebola appeared around 11 million times. Now, you'd say, holy cow, that's a lot, right? Well, last week, the same time that they were comparing data, guess how much the word coronavirus appeared in the media? Any guesses? 1.5 billion times, like Donald Trump says, billion, okay? 1.5 billion, as opposed to just 11 million for Ebola. Now think about what that can do to a society and to a world and to people. I mean, this word is being ingrained into the minds of people to instill fear. And so um, it's just a shame. And that was last week. Since then, the chaos has erupted even further. And honestly, any channel you turn on, any radio station, any social media page, it's all about coronavirus. So that number is probably, I would say, 20 billion by now. <clears throat> so it's just uh, kind of scary to think how um, the media can take something and blow it up. Um, and it really can just destroy the world. And it also kind of shows you how connected everybody is, right? And I have a theory on this. Now, I'm obviously a believer in some sort of higher power, some sort of divine being, some sort of creator, some sort of uh, spiritual a guy in the sky who answered me that day. And I don't know who he is. I don't know what his purposes are. I don't know why he um, does things like this or allows things like this, or perhaps he has no control over things like this. Who the hell knows? But to me, it seems a little strange, right? Doesn't it seem kind of funny how this epidemic, this pandemic has sort of taken everybody and said, slow down, right? Let's get back to the basics. Let's slow everybody down. You guys are going way too fast in this thing called life. This world is getting way too ahead of itself. We need to slow down. We need to do a factory reset, a reboot, if you will, and everybody needs to just chill the you-know-what out. That's what it seems like to me. It seems like, you know, something up there just kind of turned the power off for a little while. <clears throat> and now everybody doesn't know what to do with themselves because we're all shut down. Personally, my company has already laid off almost everybody. Um, I, myself, and two others, one of them being the owner, are the only three left. Um, we rely heavily on trade shows for a lot of our income. And so um, not having those trade shows has been a death blow to us. Um, the only positive is that it's a universal struggle and it's not just a, you know, my company struggle. So we're all in this thing together and... Um, Thankfully, a lot of our uh, bills and our debts and our lease and our Amex payments, they're all allowing forbearance 
um, for you know two, three, four months, however long we need. But it's a scary thing. It really is. And um, it just kind of wakes you up and, and humbles you a little bit in terms of <clears throat> how everything could be changed in a second. So, um, yeah, so we'll see what happens. As of right now, I still have my job. Um, if things get really bad, we could be laying off everybody, the last three of us, um, and just kind of chilling and hunkering down for a while until this thing passes. Um, obviously, I'm not doing any travel. There's no reason to. Nobody's going to be at these things because they've all been canceled. So, um, yeah, it's kind of kind of odd. Um, but <clears throat> we are, uh, with that said, my company still had um, a backlog of a lot of work that we had accumulated over the first couple months of the year um, that would have been produced over the next month. So what happens is since myself and the other two guys are the most versatile in the company, um, and have done it all from start to finish. We started in production, we worked our way up through the ranks. And so um, we're the final three and we're gonna be doing uh, production, we're gonna be taking sales calls, we're gonna be running email promotions and marketing campaigns and just a lot of stuff. So um, I say that we're out of work, uh, but I don't mean that literally. I mean that the, the workload for the three of us has just increased dramatically. So. Um, we will be basically coming in, uh, manufacturing the product ourselves, doing all the upholstery of certain products ourselves, all the assembly lines of products, restocking, reordering, all sorts of stuff. And then on the flip side, also having headsets on where we can answer the calls, handle the customer service, take the sales calls, send out marketing campaigns, do e-blasts and stuff of that nature. So it's just, uh, it'll be a hectic time for sure. And so with that said, uh, I do not know uh, what my immediate future holds as far as sharing audios. I know that I had promised some people that I would critique Ward Fenley's um, uh, YouTube uh, anti-IO video on my last uh, sharing, and I still 100% plan on doing that. Absolutely, I am going to do that because I just love to critique anti-IO videos and rip them to shreds. So I am gonna do that, mark my words. I just don't know when. It certainly won't be within the next month. It may not even be within the next two months because there's a lot going on here. <clears throat> and uh, we need to kind of try to keep the wheels on. And my focus, honestly, right now is not on the Bible. It's on, you know, like everybody else's focus is probably, it's on making sure that uh, when this thing blows over, we still have a job to come back to. So. With that said, folks, I wish you all the best in this Corona time. I hope you all enjoy it with a Corona with a lime. Um, and, uh, you know, try not to panic. Try not to fear. Um, Jesus is not coming back. This is on us. We got to figure this out. We got to get it under control. Um, and I think we will. I think it's going to take a little time. Um, they were saying Trump had said July and August yesterday. Well, I hope that doesn't mean that there won't be any uh, businesses open until July or August because that would suck. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe he's just saying that that's when we'll have it under full control. Um, but that, you know, maybe things would open up long before that. I'm not really sure. But one thing that was interesting is there was a psychic lady who actually predicted this. can't remember her name, but if you Google it, you'll find it. She predicted this like 11 or 12 years ago that in 2020, there would be this massively devastating virus that would sweep the globe. Um, and uh, her prediction was that it would vanish. It would, it would sweep the globe and then it would suddenly vanish just as quickly as it appeared. And then her other prediction was that it would reappear 10 years later in the year 2030 for a short time and then it would vanish again and never come back. So I'm wondering, you know, like, was this lady on something? Did she uh, know about this? Was she um, a prophet? Who knows, right? Or she was probably just very lucky and was very uh, fortunate to have this thing come true, I guess. I don't know. But uh, that was kind of interesting. So if her predictions are true, then that means this thing should just suddenly vanish at some point. So we'll have to wait and see. But you heard it here on Consistent Preterism first, if it does happen. All right, folks, I hope you all have a great day. Stay healthy, stay safe, 
Don't go spitting in anyone's mouth or opening your mouth so people can spit in yours. And we'll catch you on that flippity-floppity. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.